Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Welcome to Covenant Calendar. It is such a blessing that you are here. Hallelujah. Today, we are going to look at the Tukufa shadow marking. This is my personal version three, and I redo this because we learn as we go. Because we want to be here to, and learn, as it says in Psalms 90, verse 12, teach us to number our days. So how do we do that? Basically, we set up a little sundial experiment. So this picture kind of says it all in one slide, but we will go deeper into this, into this presentation. But basically, we have a board. We have a gnomon, which is just an object that casts the shadow from the sun. We have the tip of the shadow that we mark from the gnomon, and we have the Takufa sign right there. So we mark the tip of the casted shadow throughout the day, and when those markings make a straight line, we have our Takufa sign. So I'm gonna talk about some basic questions in this presentation when to mark the shadow, where to mark the shadow, what to use to mark the shadow, and how to mark the shadow. And this is very, very beginner friendly. So when to mark, we wanna start practicing today literally as soon as possible. It's better to practice before the Tukufa, also called Equinox, just because everyone lives in different areas and you will learn a lot from practicing. So it's important to test your specific area and your specific materials to see what works best for you. So for the Tikufa, when to track, we want to track once a week leading up to the Tikufa, just so you can set up your test your setup. We want at least one day of full tracking the week before, again, for practice. And then the week of Tukufa, we want to have at least three days. So minimum of three days, ideally the day before, the day of, and the day after. And having the day before and the day after will help us compare the curves to the straight line on the day of. And you'll notice the day before and the day after that that curve is very, very, very minimal. It's going to look straight and then all of a sudden it will curve, depending on where you are, of course where to track. So where to set up and track, you wanna put your shadow marking set up on a flat surface. You wanna find an area that's free from casted shadows, things like trees, buildings, etc. They all cast large shadows. And this area should also be free from interruption. So people, animals, lawnmowers, etc. We don't want our setup to move. So this picture here is of my mom's front yard. So I set up right here because there's a tree over here. You can see a shadow here. And I realized the day before I looked out in the front yard throughout the day, there's going to be some cast shadows in the morning from the tree over here. And then in the back of the picture is where my mom's house is. So in the afternoon, evening, the house is going to have a shadow, you know, and it's going to come up right here. So I kind of found a sweet spot right there in the middle of the yard. I also went to the park. So this is kind of where a baseball field is. So there are some trees, but it's a big wide open space. So you can test if you have a park near you and you know you might have some people coming over asking what you're doing and then you can spread the good news to them. Maybe you live by the beach, you can go to the boardwalk or you can go right on the sand. Anywhere there's where there's a wide open space and you can get it on a flat surface. The wide open space is going to be helpful because then you won't have to worry about cast shadows from buildings and trees, et cetera. So more about where to track. Again, your setup must stay in the same spot unmoved for the entire tracking day. You can move your setup after collecting data between marking days, unless you want to mark multiple days on the same board to compare the lines day to day. Then you would keep the setup unmoved throughout all marking days. So what materials will you need? You will need a board. So you can use a foam board that you can get at the dollar store, craft store. 
You can use a light colored piece of wood. You can use plastic signage, anything that's flat, really. My mom's a dog groomer, and this is, this is a grooming table that I set up in her front yard. You'll need a gnomon, so some kind of object that will cast a shadow. A fine tip pencil to mark the tip of that shadow. In this picture, I actually used marker, and I found that pencil is better because the marker might bleed out and become larger than the actual tip of the shadow. So just for a more accurate marking, a fine tip pencil would be best. Then you can use tiny push pins to mark the tip of the shadow unless you just want to rely on the pencil point. You'll need a camera or a phone to take pictures of your data. And you'll also need a fine piece of thread. And I'll explain what we're going to do with these materials. Nomen tips, pun intended, you can use a sharpened pencil. You can use a toothpick. You can use a sewing needle, a screw, and we suggest one and a half inches. That might be a good size to prevent ghosting, which I'll talk about. And it needs to be stable and not move during the tire tracking day. So this example right here is a pencil point. This one is a toothpick and this one is a screw. So you can see that there's a nice, there's a nice tip, a nice point so that you can accurately mark where the tip is. Now for ghosting out, you might notice that early in the morning and late in the evening, you can see it's kind of ghosting out right there, which means the tip of the shadow just disappears slightly. And it's difficult to see the, where the exact tip is. So on the screw, you can see a little bit where the tip is, but it's very faint. Same with the pencil. And this is a needle, a threading needle right here. This might also happen with a taller gnomon because you'll notice the taller that the gnomon is, the larger the shadow it is. How to track. So you're gonna run your board east to west with the gnomon pointing north. So this is just a simple compass app and you're gonna have, you're gonna have the board long ways running east to west with the gnomon, your object here, this is a pencil facing north. You want to track a minimum of 10 hours each day just because that larger set of data is going to show a more pronounced curve. As I mentioned, the day of, the day before, and the day after, you're, it's very, very minimal, the curve that you're going to see. So if you have a larger set of data, it's you're going to be able to notice that curve more than you know if you had a shorter amount of time. Start as early as you can. As soon as the sun is creating a shadow on your board and get as late in the day as you can before your board is covered in shadows. <clears throat> so some more on how to track, as I just mentioned, get as early as you can in the morning. You definitely want to mark solar noon. That point is important. Get as late as in the day as you can before your board is covered in shadows. And you're going to want to track at least once an hour in between. So as early as you can, and then an hour after that, an hour after that, whenever solar noon is, and then what, at least once an hour between the early and late latest marking. And you're gonna wanna note down the times that you track for each pin, you know, knowing the exact time that you're tracking for each point. <clears throat> for data collection, we need to know the date that you're marking, your location, state, province, et cetera the time zone name that you're in or the UTC, total shadow marking, so how many how many points did you, did you mark, the first marking time, the last marking time, solar noon time for your location, the height of your nomen, the length from the first marking to the last marking. You'll also want to mark directions on your board, north, east, west, and south on the pictures that you send or on the board itself. Include your initials, pictures, which we'll talk about on the next two pages, and then send all of your data to the team leader. For data collection, specifically on the pictures. So we're going to take a fine piece of thread, connect the thread to the first data point. So you can just put a pin and then wrap it around that pin, and then pull the thread to the last data point and wrap it around that one. Ignore everything else in between. 
don't connect it or wrap it around these other points. What we want is just a straight line from the first to the last, ignore everything else in between. Because we wanna see where these points sit on this thread without touching them. That way we can tell if they're either you know, north of the or south, and that's going to help us see that curve or straight line. So just first to last, that's it. How to take your pictures. We need four pictures total. So we want one picture of the entire board right here so we can see all of the data points that you marked. We'll also need a close-up of the first marking, one picture of a close-up of solar noon time, and one picture of a close-up of the very last marking that you have. So now I just wanna talk about what I've learned with my first setup so this one was in my mom's front yard. The second time was also my mom's front yard, just a different setup. So this one, I had two different boards. You can see, obviously, they're very different sizes, uh, different lengths in board and also different lengths in the gnomon. And I tested different areas for cast shadows. So in this picture, you can see that this board is covered by shadows, but this one I'm able, or yeah, covered by the tree shadows, but this one isn't yet. So I was able to get the marking there. I used a pointy tip gnomon for this one. This is the end of a screw. And then this one is the top of the screw. And I found that a pointy tip gnomon provides a more accurate mark. And I also learned that larger gnomons may ghost out, as I mentioned, early in the morning and late in the evening. Like I mentioned, taller gnomons will require a longer board. So on the left here, I have a 16 by 16 inch board and a one and a half inch gnomon. And you can see that the the distance between just one hour between markings isn't that large. But then with a 48 by 15 and a half board, I used a three inch gnomon, so double, double the size of gnomon. And you can see that the distance is much greater between one just a one hour difference. You'll also see that a taller gnomon will provide a more pronounced curve. So you can see on the left right here, it's you can see the curve, it's very obvious, but on the, on the right with the lar larger gnomon, it's, it's more pronounced. Some more tips, like I just, or I showed in this one, you can see that the shadow will be longest when the sun is rising. So this point right here is when it was rising. You can see on my board where north, east, west, south is. So east is over here the sun hits the gnomon and then casts the shadow. So this is the first one, this is the last mark. And you'll also notice that the shadow will be very close to the gnomon when the sun is directly above it. So right here, this is around noon time. It's gonna be very, very close to your gnomon. Since they are also, the shadow tips are also going to be very close to each other day to day. So if you are marking multiple days on the same board, I would suggest using very, very thin points or just use a different color to mark each day because you'll notice that they'll start to get crowded. So the red pin here is day one at 944 in the morning. And then the yellow pin here is at 1001, so just, or no, uh, 949. So just a few minutes in between and then a few minutes after that, it's, it's very close. And this, I believe, is with the larger gnomon anyway. Yeah, you can see this is the larger gnomon. So, and they're right on top of each other, basically. So I would suggest starting with a clean slate each day, or if you are going to mark your multiple days on the same board, just use a different colored pencil or very, very thin needles, just so that they don't get crowded and push each other out, because then you're gonna have data that's moving, which isn't going to be accurate. And then also be mindful of how you secure your gnomon because as I just mentioned, around noon, it'll be much closer to the gnomon. Here I have tape and I would have to move the tape to mark and that could potentially move the gnomon. So we want the board and the gnomon itself to stay in place. So just be mindful of how you secure your gnomon to your board. This was the second setup that I did. I mentioned before, this is a dog grooming table. And this time I used paper that's been taped down. I have two different gnomons set up on the same board. So this one on the left is the top of a round of a screw. This one on the right is a corsage pin. 
And I did do two setups on the same board just to compare, you know, different size nomens. So I learned that taping paper down isn't the most accurate way to mark because wind will go under the paper. You can see it kind of moves the paper and blows it around, even though I have it taped down. And then you'll also notice that when you're marking the shadow, the paper is going to be raised a little bit. So where you mark, you're going to be pressing the paper down and it's, it's just not going to be accurate because you're having movement there. We don't want our setups to move. We also learned that a pointy tip gnomon works better than a rounded tip. So version two that, that we did a few months ago, we thought that maybe a, a pin with a ball on top would provide an accurate mark because we thought, okay, we can just mark right here where the pin meets the top. But we decided that it isn't that accurate because it's hard to judge where to actually mark. Where, where is that exact tip where it meets the ball? So now we're thinking a pencil, toothpick, something that has a pointed tip would be more accurate. So quick summary. Your location must be unmoved and free from cast shadows. Materials that you'll need, a flat, lightly colored surface with a pointy tipped gnomon. One and a half inches we recommend to prevent ghosting. When, practice ASAP. Mark at least three days, the day before, the day of, and the day after to Kufa. 10 hours of tracking minimum, but get at least as early and late as possible, plus solar noon. For the data summary, the location, we need to know the date of marking, your location, your time zone, and also to mark north, south, east, and west on your board or on your picture. The details that we'll need, total markings, first and last marking time, solar noon time, the length from the first marking to the last marking, and your, the height of your nomen. For pictures, we need four pictures total, as shown on this slide, the entire marking data, close-up of the first, close-up of solar noon, and close-up of the last marking. And remember, have fun, because this is such a wonderful and fun project. It's very fun and it's low effort, but massive, massive impact. We do this so we can number our days and honor Yahweh's modim on his time, right? We want to be on time, for him, so this is why we practice. Now for resources, I made a short link if you visit bit.ly slash takufa. This is a little page that I dedicated on my website for Yahweh's Moedim. So you'll find a quick overview of the Moedim, simple explanation of takufa, shadow marking PDFs and videos, including this one and previous versions, and instructions cheat sheet printable. So basically what I just said in the summary, it's one page, so you have everything in one place. You can print that out. This data collection sheet, if it's helpful, you can print that as well. There's a link to figure out your UTC and time zone names and a link for Solar Noon Calculator. For more in-depth studies, of course, visit studythecalendar.com. And if you have any questions, you can email questions at studythecalendar.com. We are so excited to get your data, and we hope you have a lot of fun. May Yahweh bless you and guard you. Shabbat Shalom. Okay, so Desiree, we're going to have you come in and show your what you found when you were marking last spring, March 2024, something really important. And uh, it's just a few slides, only five, six, or seven of them. So Desiree, help us out to know what you did. And I'll just uh, do the PowerPoint here for you. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Marking the Takufa. This is a picture that I pulled off the internet and on the top side of the picture is where the gnomon would be. In the middle where the red lines are, are is the Takufa straight line. And then you have your winter solstice in red, kind of a burgundy, I guess. And then the summer solstice in violet. And you notice that the winter and summer solstices are curved lines that get progressively straighter as you get to. So this is the setup that I used. This is a freezer door, which is five and a half feet long in my backyard. And the gnomon 
is three and three quarter inches long and it is very secure in the freezer door. I used a sharp number two pencil to make my marks on the door because it does not fade or wash off from the dew, rain or snow. I marked on the door as well as kept a paper copy, which I then put into an Excel spreadsheet. And we'll have a look at that in a minute. As you look at the freezer door, the left hand side is my morning markings. The right hand side would be the evening markings. And for my location here in Dillon, Montana, the evening markings had a much wider um, curve to them. I'm not sure if that's because of my location compared to other locations, but that is what I saw. The door itself remained in the exact location the entire time. So all of those marks are um, from a number of days. Did you want me to go to the next slide? Just let me know, Desiree. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So this is the schedule for spring of 2024. This is the uh, picture of the Excel spreadsheet that I mentioned on the previous slide. There's a lot of information here and we're not gonna go over that, but we're just gonna make note that again, I was uh, making marks for seven days in a row. And so up there at the top, I've got that it's March 14th through the 20th. And those are the days there numbered one through seven. I was making note of certain times that I noticed patterns. And then in the very middle there, that 139, 139, 138, 138, 138, 138, 137, that is solar noon in my location. So I just wanted to point that out. I began marking on the 14th for the anticipated straight line on the 19th. I plan to mark three days after the straight line for comparison purposes. However, I was only able to mark the first day, which would have been the 20th, as we had rain the next two days. I marked from about 8.30 in the morning to 6.55 in the evening, giving about 10 and a half hours of data each day. I marked about 20 times per day with the bulk of the times clustered in the early morning and late evening. And I marked solar noon every single day, which is very important and we'll go over that in a minute. Next slide, please. The process. Mark as accurately as possible. Record the earliest and latest times possible as this will reveal the curve most effectively. Record solar noon every day as it shifts slightly toward the gnomon each day or two. For instance, I have a picture here to the right. It is very blurry because it is uh, zoomed in farther than my picture would allow. But in this picture, it is, um, showing a pencil tip on the top there, that's a pencil. The bottom is an orange colored string that I was using. And then the little blue sunshine is the side which the gnomon is on. So on days one and two, solar noon was the same. And that would be the mark farthest to the right. The, it's a line farthest to the right. Day three was closer to the gnomon. Day four was closer to the gnomon than day three. Days five and six were the same, which they are under that orange string, and they are closer to the, the closer to the gnomon than day four. And finally, day seven was the closest to the gnomon, and that's the mark on the opposite side of the string. There we go. Note in this case, solar noon was at 139 the first two days, 138 the next four days, and 137 the last day. I used timeanddate.com to find solar noon for my location. This is extremely critical. You need to mark solar noon every single day, and you need to make sure you're marking it at the exact um, minute of that day. For instance, mine changed. Um, on those days from 139 to 138 to 137. So it's very critical that you know solar noon, basically the most important thing. 
And finally, you're going to pull a thin string from the earliest marking to the latest marking for each day and see if your straight line goes exactly on top of the solar noon mark for that day. Next slide, please. So these are the results. You'll note there the orange string that we're using there each day. The place of my gnomon is on the left-hand side of the picture. That would be south in my picture. 318.24, the orange string would need to curve toward the gnomon about a quarter of an inch in order for the orange string to touch the solar new mark at the pencil tip. So this pencil is on my solar noon mark for that particular day. And as you can see, the orange string does not go across the mark. The next day on 319.24, the orange string is exactly on solar noon mark at the pencil tip, making a straight line. So again, my orange string, it's the picture is zoomed in so you cannot see each end, but at the top there, you can see my husband's finger holding the orange string on the earliest mark of that day. And then I'm holding it at the opposite end of the board on the latest mark. And the string is going directly on top of solar noon, making a straight line. For comparison purposes on 32024, which would be the day after the Takufa, the orange string would need to curve away from the gnomon about a quarter of an inch to touch the solar noon mark at the pencil tip. So when you look at the pictures on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, you can see that they're opposite of each other because the curve is starting to go in opposite directions, whether you're the day before or the day after Takufa. And on my layout, that amount of change was about a quarter of an inch. That is obviously gonna vary depending on the size of your gnomon and the size of your layout in general. Next slide, please. Bonus, I have a, a pattern that I noticed. The picture here on the left is uh, the same one that I was using there on that cover page. It's off the internet. I noticed a pattern developing in my marks. When I marked at the exact same time each day, the marks fo formed a diagonal line toward the gnomon. So on that picture on the left, you can see that, the top picture, Charlene, um, you can see where I put these little blue arrows that, that it, they are forming these black diagonal lines that are going toward the gnomon. And on my picture below, again, I've zoomed it in quite a bit, so it's a little blurry, but um, I had marked all seven days on the same one. So there's a lot of markings there, but you will see that if you start down at the bottom and work your way toward the gnomon, you can see that my dots do form a diagonal line. And when I was marking, sometimes they were a minute apart so that's why it's not a perfectly straight line on those diagonals with the dots, because sometimes that was just one minute difference. So there was a lot of shifting when you come to those evening hours, and that is what that looks like real time. So the arrow on the left is about 640 in the evening. The middle area is about, uh, I believe, 630, 632. And the left one was about 616. Mm -hmm. So what I was doing, I was setting a timer on my cell phone to remind me to go out and make the shadow and, or the shadow marking. And as I was doing that, I realized, oh, if I go out at the exact same time, there's this pattern showing up. And so then I was purposely going out to create this pattern. And the pattern is there all day long. It's just easiest to see in the late evening because that is when I have the most shifting in, in the shadows that I am getting in my location. But if you'll notice on that top picture, there should be those diagonal lines all day long. And my morning marks, you, you can kind of see it, but again, there's not as much lengthening as there is in the evening. Next slide, please. This is another picture that I pulled off the internet, which is um, 
similar to the one that Jess showed earlier. So again, you have your straight line to Kufa in the middle, which is uh, kind of a turquoise color. And then the winter and summer solstices on either side. This particular type of gnomon is not straight up and down because um, they're using a different type of shadow casting. So with that, I say happy marking. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you for your time. Uh, Desiree, I'm just going to go back to slide six. And I just wanted to point out what is happening here because you did mark at the same time every day, pretty much within the minute. And that in the evening, that these marks, I, I can see um, this one was 618 right here. Uh, mm -hmm. This middle one looks like 632. And the last one is 640. So there's not a lot of time in between 618, 632, and 640. But they're very far apart because the shadow moves very quickly in the evening and in the morning. But it seems like you see a, a greater distance of movement in the evening. So yes, I do for sure in my location. Mm -hmm. And as Desiree said, you can see you can see these patterns and all the other marks. Unfortunately, like this is a five foot board uh, freezer door, so it's hard to zoom in so you can see the whole picture. But you can see the patterns there. So when she was marking it exactly the same day on all the uh, same time on all those seven days, she was seeing a pattern develop. And that's the neat part. So absolutely happy marking everyone. Absolutely. So uh, this is very short, about 25 slides or so. And this is going to be a wrap up of we're going to be talking about International Dateline. And it's Teshuvah and Yahuwah's covenant calendar, not any other kind of calendar, but Yahuwah's covenant calendar. So what does the Teshuvah shadow have to do with this international date line? And another question, is it possible for everyone in the world to be on the same 24-hour day and date for Yahuwah's worship statutes of his covenant calendar. Now, this question is worded very specifically. We're going to go through it again right now. Is it possible for everyone in the world to be on the same 24-hour day and date for Yahuwah's worship statutes of his covenant calendar? Because we learned something very special and it all started back in March 2023. Well, the answer is no. It is not possible for everyone to be on the same day and the same date for covenant calendar. Well, why is that? Well, because this is what happens. This is approximately what the uh, world looks like at this time. Oh, right. <laughs> 11 o'clock. September 7th, this is in my area of basically Prince George. I chose that. And right now we're at 11, 11. So right now in the world, if you could be up there looking down, you would see that we have sunshine over here in this part of the world. Sunshine, the moon is here, and the night season is over here. This part of the world is in night season. You can see these um, shadows right here. These are our twilights, our three different twilights. You can see that New Zealand is just about coming into sunshine there. So what is going on? Well, over here where we have our light season, it is today, September 7th. It's Shabbat for us over here. But then we have this Roman midnight marker. Happens at midnight when the clock strikes 12 o'clock midnight. This changes the day and the date. So at this marker, this part of the world over here became September 8th, according to Roman reckoning of timing. And over here on this left side is still all September 7th. Well, that's because of Rome. Rome has some ways to designate how we start our days and how we end our days. But we all know that there's a little bit something different happening with covenant calendar because the day 
and the date do not change until you come to your first dawn light in the sky. So where that night is ending and dawn is starting to break the horizon, that is where Covenant Calendar starts their new date and their new day. So right here in this part of the world, right now, at this moment, is where September 8th would be starting for them, not at the midnight marker. Well, but there is another date changer. Did you know? It has something to do with this line way out here in the Pacific Ocean. It's called Man's International Dateline. And what man has done is placed a dateline right here, kind of where nobody lives. And what they have said is that when you cross from the west side, across that line, you will be on a different date and a different day. And man has also set up these 24 time zones and they've divided the world, all of the parts of the world into these 12 time zones. So we can kind of figure out where we are on our day. In March 2023, it was also discovered that Yahuwah has his own international dateline, and it isn't in the Pacific Ocean right here. We're going to find out where it is. But Tim has some things that he wants to share with you first. So did you know that when Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, he was talking about his international dateline? Well, let's look at Ecclesiastes 1.5. And this is a problem that some people have had in the past. They, they, under, or they think that the Tukufa happens all at once, the big circuit. Ecclesiastes 1.5. The sun also rises and the sun sets and hurries back to the place where it arose. It's important to understand there's a point of beginning and there's a point of finish. I like kind of like a race. You start and you end. It doesn't all happen at once. It takes time for that sun to go around the earth. Yahuwah chooses where his international dateline begins. The Tekufa then begins reflecting onto this earth. And I want you to see that uh, 360 degree circuit that is eternal. That Pi sign there, or, or insignia, whatever it is, icon, that cannot be found in a 354-day lunar calendar. It cannot be found in a 364-day Zadok calendar. It cannot exist in those calendars. The only time you can find that, that pi mark is in a 360-degree circle. Yahuwah designed this. That pi represents infinity and eternity, if they're probably both the same. That is why the 360-degree circle is so incredibly important. So I want you to look at this disc, and I want you to use your imagination a bit. And let's say it's Earth. We're going to be looking at the next slide coming up here. When, when Yahuwah spoke to Moshe in Exodus 12, verse 2, he was indicating that there is a start of the Tekufa circuit and that there's an end to it. And it's our duty to find out where that start and finish line is. Exodus 12, verse 2. This month is the beginning of months for you. It is the first month of the year for you. If there's a first, there has to be a last month. There has to be a point of departure, and a point to return to. It's that simple. Clearly, the sun's tekufa, and the, the word tekufa means circuit, the sun's tekufa does not drop onto earth as a fully complete 360-degree circle. It must have a point of departure and a point to finish at. Yahuwah has declared that. It's written in Ecclesiastes 1, verse 5. And again, that circle from point of departure to point of finish is 360 degrees. Where did the degrees come from? Because at the very beginning, it was 360 days. 
And it's, it's a documented fact that the degrees come from the fact of 360 days. A degree for a day before Hezekiah's time. We'll get into that at another time. So when there's a point of departure and a point to finish, who determines the start? Who decides the end? Does man decide that? And what about who decides where it is and who decides when? Does man have that authority or is it Yahuwah? Well, we look at the 354-day calendar, the lunar calendar, and again, it does not have a, a, a correct pattern for start and finish. It is a rogue calendar. It is not uniform. It cannot supply unity. That is the same to be said with a 364-day uh, calendar from the Zadok, or originally, as we know it, from the Dead Sea Scrolls. It does not supply uniformity on a calendar. You cannot have Yahuwah's people unified year after year after year to observe Passover, Abib 14. It cannot happen. Yet, when we go to the 360-degree calendar, it's there solid eternally. In 2023, as, as Charlene has already mentioned, Yahuwah revealed to those who were marking, note that sentence, to those who were marking, some went by NASA and they were wrong. Did you hear what I said? Some went by NASA and they were wrong. In 2023, Yahuwah revealed to those who were marking the final shadow moments of the Takufa circuit, which I call the day of teshuva because it's the day of turning it's the point of where it ends and it begins the new one it's teshuva it turns around and this is all this all was within the tekufa circuit and it marked a very specific vertical i guess i could can i say vertical maybe i shouldn't have had vertical there <laughs> but it marks a very direct line across the face of this earth where was it it was roughly in the center of North America in 2023. And we have termed that, the best that we can know of, as Yahuwah's international dateline. It's, we can say it another way, it's Zion's international dateline, because it's based out of Zion, or some will understand that as Zion. Before the initial 24 hours was completed, A little bit too fast there. <laughs> so <clears throat> when when that marking was done at the very beginning at a specific point on the earth in 2023, it took 24 hours for that marking to go around full circle. Yet just before the initial 24 hours was completed, note this everybody, before the full 24 hours was completed on the same date where under Zion, not on earth, not according to man's designation under the same date, according to Zion, the shadow was marked by our fine leader in Michigan. And if you ask Kim, she'll probably let you know who that was. <laughs> and it was approximately 23 hours after the initial marking of the shadow in the West. Note again, it was the same date under Zion. Was it about 23 hours later? Yes. But under Yahuwah's granddaddy time clock, it was the same date. We are dis we're discarding man's designation of time. Remember, we're on Yahuwah's clock. We're on his appointed times. We're not on man's crazy days. Go ahead, next slide. So when, when that leader of Triple C began her new year, it was at the next dawn. That shadow then 
when she had her marking started, it took another 24 hours for that shadow to go a full circle, 360 degrees, to complete her location. And that shadow, when it was activated, would uh, count to Passover. It was all done. It was all activated, I should say, within one 24-hour period on this earth. Now, at this point, when the leader in Michigan marked her Teshuvah shadow, it again, I had already said this, but I can say it again. It commenced another 24 hours. Why? Because it had to complete her locational 360 degrees in the Shanae here. There had to be another 24 hours. So at this point, there was another, what was it? Uh, there had to be, well, it's coming up on the next slide. So at the next point where the, of the completed circuit, yes, it took 48 hours to complete a full revealing of the Teshuvah's shadow to each person, depending on their location on this earth. Yet, the initial point of time determination was fully unified within one 24-hour cycle. Yahuwah's people will be unified on under the Teshuva shadow. We will be unified and we will begin observing his Moedim, the set-apart appointed festivals, on time, unified on Abib 14. I do not know of another calendar that can accomplish this. I do not know of another system that can accomplish this. Why is this perfect? Because this is what is under covenant. This is what was blood ratified at Mount Sinai. This is the system that brought the Hebrew nation out of Mitzrayim. Who are we? Where are we going? Aren't we coming out of Mitzrayim? Aren't we going into the promised land? Once again, this is what was taught to Moshe, uh, Acts 7, verse 22. Moshe was trained in the wisdom of, of the people of Mitzrayim. This is the system that they used, the Tekufa circuit, judged by the day of the shadow, or the Teshuvah. Yahuwah had Moshe specifically trained in this system, so that when he did come to Mitzrayim, when he did bring them out to the Exodus, this was the system, this was the extremely accurate calendar they used, and through all the appointments of the journey of, of the 50 days to Mount Sinai. If any of this had not have been executed accurately, they would not have been there. Moshe would not have received the Ten Devarim on Mount Sinai. It would have been a false situation. But Moshe was trained in this covenant, this covenant calendar. He was trained specifically to bring out the people, Yahuwah's people, out of Mitzrayim. Shall we walk in his shoes? Yahusha did this. He observed this specifically when he was on this earth. He walked it out with his sandals. His crucifixion was timed in exact precision to this system of the Teshuvah shadow. Scripture says that we should walk in his footsteps. Mm. Go ahead, Charlene. Walking in his shadow. So if there's anybody that is understanding this from before, or if this is brand new information for you, you might be <clears throat> excuse me, asking the question, what in the world is going on? Well, in March of 2023, there was a discovery a discovery of where Yahuwah places the marker for his international dateline. And it's very interesting. It was like a Red Sea experience. So this is just a summary here, this chart, of what actually happened. And we didn't have a lot of people marking. Uh, this was the beginning of, of a new understanding. But I just want to show you what was happening. Basically, here's the world map of the way that things look for the night season and the day season on that uh, Teshuvah day in March, 2023. 
So our night season was right here, covering over Africa and Europe, okay? Um, we had Nathaniel helping us, and he had it charted out with the time zones as E, F, G on his scale. But this F here is corresponding to the F on this big screen. So we didn't use the number system like we're used to. But anyway, what we found is that the very first straight line shadow data that was reported to Nathaniel came from Arkansas in this area, and it was on March the 19th. And then after that, we had data come in from Montana, excellent data from Montana and from Tim in Alberta about March 19th. And there was data from California. And we didn't find out for about five weeks later that Oklahoma sent in their data and they too had March 19th. Teshuba for these places, and yes, there was only a few, there was only five, but they saw a straight line to Shuva shadow on March 19th, and it was first cycle. It was a Sunday that year. Well, as the sun continues to move and goes around and crosses that date line, there was data that came in from Australia and very good data from South Africa that was telling us something different. And then there was Nathaniel's own data from West Virginia and we had data from Kim, the very last report. Kim's data was coming in as a straight line. All of these from the other side, okay, were coming as a straight line to Shuba Shadow on March the 20th. And that was a Monday. Hmm, that was a surprise to a lot of us. So in 2023, that first shadow recorded on March the 19th was around Arkansas, about north central Arkansas, along with the uh, data from the west to Oklahoma, Montana, California, and Alberta. They all ended up having their Passover on April the 2nd, 2023, in those areas. And all the data that was collected east of this red bar all the way to Africa and Australia, putting that region of the world on an April 3 Passover in 2023. And that is what we found happened. So this is the marker right here. It appeared, as far as we could understand, as we didn't have markers between this space of Arkansas and Michigan, which could be about 300 to 400 mile distance, we had CC uh, Covenant Calendar members there, but they weren't marking, and that's okay because we're all learning. But this is the closest that we could tell. This is the difference because this data in Arkansas was excellent, excellent data. That's when the pictures come in and you can tell what's happening, even with just a very few markers around the world. So the new discovery from March 2023 to a year later in March 2024 was this. That first marker was here. And then what happened? Well, in March 2024, Yahusha's international date line relocated to a new position. We now found that it had moved over to this area, just west of Wales and Ireland and United Kingdom there in the Atlantic Ocean. I'm just keeping this table down here for the time zones. Okay, well, how did this all come to be? Well, first of all, what I want to say is um, after we saw this happen uh, in March of 2023, we went into a worldwide project to a shadow mark and a lot of people got on board to shadow mark and I'm going to show you what happened. This is what happened in March 2024. We had a lot of people shadow marking, um, some from Canada. I was not able to mark because I had too much cloud and snow up here in BC. And we have a lot of CC members in the United States. And these uh, gold um, pentagons here, these gold shapes, these are people that were marking many, many times, sent in a lot of data 
all over the United States. There was um, another marker in Utah, not a Covenant Calendar member, but uh, this person was marking a March 20th straight line shadow. Everybody else had a March 19th. Now, we don't really understand because it was good data. We don't understand how they had a March 20th Teshuva straight line shadow because everybody else here scattered all over the United States, north, south, east, and west, uh, even had some marking from Hawaii. And Tim's was really good up there in Calgary, Alberta. Everybody else had good data for March the 19th. So we knew that North America, basically this part of the world, was on a March 19th shadow line for that day. So there would have been a Passover for them on April the 2nd of 2024. Looking at the rest of the world, we do did have quite a bit of shadow marking going on, even though our population is a lot sparser. But the pink, the pink on the other side of the world are people that marked and had data that was showing a straight line on March the 20th, all except for two. There was one over here in the Philippine area, uh, was questionable, weren't really sure about that. There was another one, uh, Rianne, up here in Wales. Um, Nathaniel called it questionable. We're going to talk about that next. But out of everything that we saw, all of these pink forms uh, to New Zealand, Australia, good data here in Australia, and New Zealand had good data. South Africa had excellent data. We had data from uh, Kenya and Malawi area also from Dubai and whatnot, good, good data. So we thought, okay, we're seeing something and you can see it too. It very much looks like Yahuwah's international dateline was somewhere in the ocean. Well, we don't have too many people living in the ocean. And this is what Nathaniel said, that as he was been marking over many, many years, that he saw this international dateline sort of always land in the ocean somewhere, but he didn't have as many markers to check their data. This all just happened from our last year marking. So Passover, April 2, this is for the time zones, minus 3 to minus 10. Minus 3 would be about here to minus 10. And then Passover on April the 3rd for time zones 0. Okay, GM. Um, uh, time zones right here, 2 plus 12, which is New Zealand. So there was a split here. Okay, but as Tim already showed you, everybody is within the 24 hour cycle. Now, this new discovery for March 2024, what did it do? We it moved. Yahuwah's international dateline has moved quite a bit. So our question now is: did we make the correct assessment to have this division right here? Was that the correct assessment? Because you remember, there was a mark up here at Wales that we were saying was questionable. And I want to look at that a little bit closer because everyone, I think we are learning something and I think we might have missed it last March. This is just a close up of England and Wales. Rianne is up here in the south part. I think I've got her pretty much placed at the right, correct area. For March 19th data, it was good data. We also had Angie marking at Isle of Wight. They're both Covenant Calendar members. Both had excellent data. Very, very good data. Just like we already saw from Jess, all the pictures, everything was there, all the points that we needed. And like I said, therefore, we decided that Yahuwah's international date line was likely just west of Wales because we were questioning if this data was correct or not. We had a question there. So that is why we placed Yahuwah's international dateline here on the other side. And of course, that would be in the Atlantic Ocean. However, due to the close proximity of these two places, okay, the question has come up if March 19th data here in Wales was accurate or inaccurate. I'm questioning that now. So for lack of additional data from that area, we had concluded that Wales 
you know, we're going to knock that one out because it just didn't look like it fit. And we thought that Wales should have a March uh, start March 21 for their first day of the year. However, I'm wondering if that was the best decision and if it was the right choice. And here's the reason why. Because from this area in Wales to about Isle of Wight, it is approximately four hours of travel. That's not a long distance. What does that mean? It could be very, very likely that Yahuwah's international dateline was actually right here. And why am I saying that? Because both sets of data were excellent. I believe that we might have made a little tiny mistake and made making an assumption that was maybe perhaps not true. But we're doing the best that we can as we go along. So the question is, was Yahuwah trying to show us something more accurate in March 2024 and we missed it? Remember, from the North America side, we had quite a large distance of probably almost uh, three to 400 miles in between. Four hours of travel is not a lot of distance. So I just want to give um, compliments to the ladies that were marking over there. They did an excellent job. I think we have something to learn yet. So here in March 2023, just approximately, Yaw's International Dateline places here in March 2023. And then in March 2024, we placed it approximately here in the Atlantic Ocean. What does that mean? That between these two spots, these are our time zones at the top. Each one represents an hour. 24 time zones, 24 hours in a day. So between these time zones is approximately five and a half time zones, five and a half hours. What did we find? On the west side, it was March 19th that we found the Teshuva shadow. Everyone from this international dateline here going this direction to the west had a straight line shadow on March the 19th. On the other side, because we had quite a few markers, on the east side, they had a March 20th straight line Teshuva shadow. So why did Yahuwah's 2024 international dateline not return to the same position as was found in 2023? Why did Yahuwah's international dateline not stay here? Why did it move? Well, this is because the vernal equinox year is the amount of time from one spring equinox, this is north of the equator, to the next. That means that as the sun completes its circuit, as the sun goes all the way around, okay, and completes its circuit, this here is 365 days, right here on this marker. But our year is not exactly 365 days long. It has this decimal point of 0.242374. And that Marlene? tells us, yes, go ahead. I was going to ask a question. <clears throat> what is going to happen when we find that that international dateline of Yahuwah, it doesn't move? When we're, when we're looking at the shadow and we're marking the shadow, and we find that that dateline doesn't move. It's in the exact same position that it was the year prior. What, what should we be thinking? What's the possibility? That's a good question. And I think Covenant Calendar will have the answer. So we, we can talk about that. Absolutely. So the thing is that it didn't, it didn't stay here. It moved. It moved from last year to this year. It has moved. And the reason is, is because that our year is more than 365 days. It's that 0.242374 that equals about five hours and 49 minutes, okay? And those five hours and 49 minutes is approximately that many portions on the time zones, about five and a half time zones, okay? That's what we're going to see. So it appears that the five hours and the 49 minutes is demonstrated by moving east, east of this marker, east about five and a half time zones to the new position for Yahuwah's international dateline 
in March of 2024. Some very interesting things were happening. And we had to do all of this shadow marking to, to see this. Now, what I want to say is, <clears throat> everyone, we could have figured this out if we would have just sat down and just thought about it. But we had to do the worldwide shadow marking to actually see visually what was happening. So due to the patterns that we have seen, we feel that Yahuwah's international dateline can be calculated in advance for its placement in March of 2025. Now, why would we want to do that? Well, here's the reason, because we have people on the other side of the world over there in Malaysia, Philippines, and people that are learning uh, India, Pakistan, even Africa, that are learning and they're calling us and writing us and saying, when is our calendar? When do we start? When is our Passover? Well, how do we know? <laughs> we're not there to mark the shadow, but we're just wondering now, will we have a clue? So we'll just take our marker, five and a half time zones, and we all know that in March 2024, the marker was somewhere there in the Atlantic Ocean or around Wales. And if you move the very same distance, because every year has these five hours and 40 minutes, okay, if you move the same distance, we are wondering if the March 2025 Teshuvah Shadow will land right here around Pakistan, India area. Because doesn't it have to go about the same distance? Let's continue on. Right now, it is important for all Covenant Calendar members to be practicing to mark the September Teshuvah, that straight line shadow, because this is your practice time to be ready for March of 2025. This is the time you want to see if you can find that sweet spot that Jess was talking about. And what is the reason? Because Covenant Calendar uh, classroom leaders are looking for Yahuwah's patterns so that we can help others with their calendar dates in various areas of the world. Now, I was working with somebody here just a few months ago and uh, uh, we're, was telling him that we were tracking this, you know, Yahuwah's international dateline and the reason. And he said to me, I think he was on his ADOT calendar. He said, well, I don't see why you have to know that information. Well, you don't. If you're just doing it for your own little area, you don't need it. But if you've got people that are trying to learn and they're coming to you with questions, you have to have some way to answer them. So this is why we're looking at a bigger scale. That is why in March of 2024, you have probably noticed that there are two different calendars. You have to be able to choose which calendar is for the area of where you live. So that's why we're asking people to get familiar with these time zones. They're all marked, they are all numbered, and you need to find out where you live and what time zone that you're in, because it's the time zone that's gonna tell you which covenant calendar to use. That is why everyone, that we have two covenant calendars that go up. It is because one calendar date is not going to work for everybody in the world. That is because you will be on a different day or a different date according to man's international dateline and man's midnight marker. So what I have done is I put uh, the west side is for time zones minus three to minus 10. This is the calendar if you're living in time zones minus three to minus 10. Let's just go back to that other slide. We can. Oh, I can't. Let me three. No, it's not letting me go back for some reason. <clears throat> but anyway, we'll get to it. And we also have one that is, says east, and there are different colors. So if you see the east side calendar, that is for time zones zero to plus 12. These would be the dates for where you're living in those time zones. So that's why we're offering two. I've had many, many questions. Which calendar do I use? It's like you need to read your calendars. This one had the straight shadow on March the 19th, and the east side had this straight shadow on March the 20th. <clears throat> so what does this do? It just moves the dates one different. You can see here on the west side, Passover was on April the 2nd, 
and on the east side, Passover was April the 3rd. But the good news is that we were all within that one 24-hour window. So you need to choose the calendar that's going to have your current time zone. <clears throat> so looking forward to March 2025, what are we actually looking for? What is the most important piece that we're looking for this time? Everyone, it's in this window right here. <clears throat> this is the window that is so important for the shadow marking of 2025. The Teshuva shadow data for this designated area is very important as we seek for that repeating pattern and appearance of Yahuwah's international dateline. Marking the September Teshuva is the time to practice right now. So this part, people that are living in this area, United Kingdom, Europe, Africa, uh, Dubai, Greece, Malta, anyone in this area, really important to mark because in March, we believe we're going to see a split. Now, we don't have a lot of people in this area right here, Pakistan and India, not too many, but we do have some in Malaysia, the Philippines, Australia, and New Zealand. We do have quite a few markers in, he in here. Quite a few in Africa. So we're looking to see if Yahuwah's international dateline is going to move five and a half time zones. So that's the end of the international date line for Yahuwah. And we can, just can you go can, can you go back to that slide, Charlene? Yeah, we sure can. Everyone, I want you to look at that orange marker, the orange arrow. That is where we project according to our our pattern that is where we project Yahuwah's international dateline to be. Now, the question I have for you, and I want you to think about this very carefully what if it doesn't go to where that orange arrow is? What if it stays where the blue arrow is? What if it doesn't change? If the blue arrow, if Yahuwah's international dateline does not change, then the question is, what has changed? And what does that mean for the fulfillment of the final timeline of this earth, the 1260 days, the 3.5 years, and the 42 months? What does that mean? Does, does that mean that we've gone back to 360 days? Because it's the five days, five, five plus days that change that international dateline. And Yahuwah through scripture tells us that we are going back to 360 days. Otherwise, the final timeline of this earth cannot be fulfilled. That's why we're looking for this shadow. I, at least that's why I'm looking for it. Because I want to know when we're going back to 360 days. Yahuwah has said he will do nothing, but he will tell his servants. If we're not marking a shadow, how can he tell us? If we're not marking a shadow, it's like having your ears plugged. It's that serious. Mm -hmm. if, he, if we're out there marking and he shows us that that shadow marker, the international date line, does not move, you and I will know that we have now started the final timeline of this earth. We will know that we have 3.5 years, 1260 days, and, and 42 months to go. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's important? Mm -hmm. That's my mm -hmm. thoughts. Go ahead, Charlene. Yes, and Thank we you. can also, it, you know, uh, until that time happens, this orange marker, if perhaps it does land there, and I'm pretty sure it will, then for March 2026, we know that five and a half time zones is probably going to mark over here or maybe even close to man's international dateline. So those are the patterns that we're looking for. And they're very important patterns. Now, the other thing is that for everybody that is marking and practicing right now, you will know if we're out of contact or there's no internet or whatever, you will know that what you have marked is accurate and you will know where to place or how to count out Yahuwah's um, festivals from the place where you are living, no matter what's happening in other parts of the world. 
Well, it's really neat. There's been a lot of good things happening. Starling, you said from where you are living. What did Yahusha <laughs> tell the woman at the well? Mm -hmm. He told her that we are to worship where we are at. We are to mark the shadow where we are at. Mm -hmm. It's an individual thing. Our friends at Covenant Calendar, our friends in other calendars, cannot save us, cannot get us to the appointment, the appointments on time. Only we can do that individually. Mm -hmm. Am I stressing we need to mark our, our shadow? Yes, I really do. Thank you, Charlene. Okay, so that finishes everything up for today on Teshuva and Yehuvah's Covenant Calendar. And of course, questions at studythecalendar.com is where you can write us. If you need to have some files or anything, we'd be happy to help you. And we just say shalom. Shalom.